Well, Christmas is almost here. And uh, once you get done with the shopping, it's, it's one of the most uh, relaxing, enjoyable times of year. Amen, church? And uh, I don't know about you, but I, I, I usually use that time to uh, catch a few movies. But it seems like they're always the same ones. There's, of course, Christmas Vacation with the Griswolds. And who can forget Chevy Chase just waiting to put the Christmas lights all over the house together and none of them come on. Or the squirrel flying out of the tree. And then there's uh, Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life. You know, it's just so full of self-pity that, of course, the angel says, well, let's just see what life would look like if you never existed at all. And then, of course, there are many renditions of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, where he had good old Scrooge, you know, visited by the three ghosts of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas future. But perhaps the one unforgettable line from the whole movie comes at the very, 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 very end by little tiny Tim himself when he simply says, God bless us, every one. And that's the title of our lesson this morning. Let's turn to Luke chapter 2. And here we find the heart of God. As Jesus is born... And we read beginning in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Wow. Could you imagine being a shepherd out there in the fields that night? The angel comes, the glory of the Lord comes, and then... Thousands upon thousands of angels start singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Of course, Hallmark Cards likes that part and on earth peace to men. Amen, guys? The problem is that wasn't totally the promise of God. He said, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Rest. You know, it's kind of ironic. Historians call this one of the most, quote, peaceful times in all of the history of mankind. As a matter of fact, they label this time the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And yet, at that time as well as at this time, there may be a greater or lesser sense of peace externally. But internally, everybody yearns. For that peace that only comes with the favor of God. Today we're going to look at three individuals that found God's favor. And prayerfully allow us to find it as well. Let's go to Luke chapter 7. Our first point. God favors the sinful. So this should fire most of you guys up out there, okay? Beginning in verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. Now this was a very relaxed dinner right here. The custom of that day was to literally lie down on couches while you ate. Verse 37. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him, his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee, who had invited him and saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. She said to him, 
Simon, I've got something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back, so he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one that had the bigger debt canceled. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came in your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This sinful woman found favor and peace with God. We find the occasion here of Jesus and several others eating at Simon's house. As a custom of that day, many meals were certainly by invitation, but others were allowed to come on in to the place that they were having the meal. And so it must have been a similar occasion to this. We find that Jesus, as well as several other guests, are reclining at their couches. And the Bible says that as they were eating, this, this woman came on in, and she stood right behind Jesus. And perhaps for the very first time in her life, she was in the presence of a pure man, and she was so overcome, she began to weep. Un unbeknownst to her, at first the tears were, were so profuse that they fell off of her cheeks, and then she noticed it, it fell on Jesus' feet, and she quickly bent down and began to wipe Jesus' feet with her hair. And then she began kissing them and began to apply perfume to his feet. Of course, by this time, Simon and the rest of the people are looking at this woman that's making quite a display of Jesus and herself. And so he's thinking in his mind, Gee, if Jesus really knew who this woman was, of course, you've got to ask yourself the question, why did Simon know who he, she was? But of course, Jesus could read minds. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing at dinner time sometimes? And so Jesus, seemingly off the cuff, goes, Simon, I got a story to tell you. Simon goes, that's cool, it's dinner time, tell me your story. He says, well, there were two men, and each owned this money lender a certain amount of money. One owned them about $5,000, and the other about $50,000. Sounds like these times, doesn't it? And then this moneylender decided to cancel the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon kind of realized this might be a little bit of a setup. He goes, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. Jesus goes, exactly, exactly. He says, you know something, Simon? There's quite a contrast going on right here. I don't know if you noticed, but do you see this woman right here? Ever since she came, it's been totally different between you and her. I came into your house and nobody washed my feet with water. Yet she's come on in and the tears from her eyes have washed my feet. And then she's used her hair to wipe them. So she didn't even give me a cordial kiss when I came in, but she's not stopped kissing my feet. He says, you didn't even put oil on my head, but she's continued to pour perfume on my feet. I tell you something. Her sins, though many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. He says, but you know something? He who's been forgiven little loves little. And he simply turns to her and he says, your sins are forgiven. Then all the crowd that probably heard the whole story goes, who is this who forgives sins? And, and don't, doesn't he realize who that woman is? And Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. 
God favors the sinful. You know, right here, the lesson comes through so beautifully, I think, for all of us. Here is this woman that felt her sinfulness, her need to be in the very presence of Jesus, and she comes on in, and just in the presence of Jesus, she's totally broken. She starts crying. And she'd come to anoint him with the perfume already, but she was just so overwhelmed in his presence. And Jesus goes, hey, there's a lesson to be learned right here. Though her sins are many, she has loved much. You know, bottom line, church, we need to understand this. How much we appreciate God's forgiveness is directly proportional to how much we love him. It isn't the point that Simon, quote, was a lesser sinner than this sinful woman. The point is, is that all of us have a huge amount of sin that could never be forgiven unless Jesus died for our sins. Are you with me here, church? You know, last night we had an incredibly fun time at our uh, house church leader's Christmas dinner party and devotional at the Velasco's house. Now, we didn't have couches to lay down on, but we still had a crank in time. Uh, we start off with the name game, and I appreciate Denise Bordieri doing all the background work and everything, and, and that was a lot of fun. We had to kind of guess who the person that we were, had the name on our back was. We had an awesome meal. All the sisters brought incredible dishes. We had some great singing by Lou Jack and, and Michael, and, and then we gave out the presents. But the most powerful time by far was the sharing that we had. We read the same passage here about the shepherds. And the shepherd's response to hearing about Jesus was simply praising and glorifying God. And I just said, okay, guys, let's just look back at 2008. What one thing can we simply praise and glorify God in our life? Well, one of the first to speak up was Nick Bordieri. And I'm not going to mention that he forgot who he was supposed to give his gift to in the present exchange. That I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't want to bring that out into the open and everything. But Nick just opened on up, and you know how big-hearted Nick is. You know, I just want to, I just, I'm so thankful for this group. It's such an awesome group. We've been through so much, and yet we've all come together. Michael Kirshner spoke on up. He says, I just want to thank God for all the, the church planters that have gone out, Ron and Tracy and Kyle and Joan and DJ and Casey, these people have so inspired me. Then Michelle spoke on up, Michelle Williamson. She said, oh, I'm just so thankful for my husband, Michael. Whoa, amen. And you know, I felt that she really meant it, too. <laughs> but there were two sharings that, that, that stuck out perhaps more to me than all the other ones. The first one was by the physically youngest, and spiritually youngest person in the entire group. That was Ashley Woody. I mean, it's amazing. She's, she's got up, she's, and she's very moved when she stood up. She says, I am just so thankful to God that this past February I was baptized and I was saved. She says, you know, kind of in referencing her life, by all rights, I shouldn't even be here. That's how messed up her life had become. And then she went on. She just shared a little bit. And, and then she saw this kind of big grin come across her face. She says, you know, sometimes I get up in the morning and I don't even recognize myself. I've changed so much. That's incredible. Just 10 months in the Lord. And you can just feel her heart. The gratefulness in her heart that Jesus had forgiven all of her sins. Though her sins were many, she loved much. You know, I've really got to ask you a question. Is that your heart? That you realize how many sins you've had in your life? Particularly some of you that have been Christians for a long time. I mean, are you really just praising God and saying, I'm just so thankful I am saved that I'm right with the Lord by all rights? And many of us could say this, we shouldn't even be here. And sometimes even we look around 
If we think back to what we were like before we were baptized, we'd all smile too. We have changed so much. As with this woman whom Jesus said, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Last night, you could see the favor and the peace of God in our dear sister, Ashley. Amen, church? Let's move to our second passage in Matthew chapter 15. Now, this passage is rarely preached because I think it's somewhat misunderstood. And yet, therein lies its power. The title of our second point is, God Favors the Beggar. Beginning in verse 21 of chapter 15. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, let's stop right here. We remember that Matthew is the gospel that's written to the Jews in mind. And very interestingly, right here is the only time that's recorded in all the gospels that Jesus leaves Palestine. See, Tyre and Sidon are on the coast. They're what they would call in those days in Phoenicia, part of greater Syria. And absolutely, this is a Gentile woman, but it's amazing to think this is the only time Jesus left Palestine, so you know something incredibly significant is going to happen in this particular occasion. Verse 22, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Well, you know, there's few words that are strong in the Jew's mind as a Canaanite. I mean, after all, God told Joshua and all the Jews to wipe out the Canaanites from the promised land so they could have the promised land. And so Matthew's reminding us, hey, this is a woman that should have been wiped out. But here she is, a Canaanite woman who knew some of the scriptures because she addressed Jesus as the son of David. If you go back to Matthew chapter 4, you will find that the ministry of Jesus had had such an impact, it went well beyond the borders of Israel. As a matter of fact, so many people in Syria and Phoenicia have been affected by the preaching of Jesus Christ. And so we read on. Verse 23. Jesus didn't answer a word. So his disciples came to him, urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. It's an interesting passage, you have to admit. Amen, guys? So we see the woman comes on up very respectfully and says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. I mean, the demons were powerful on that day and the demons are powerful in this day. Are you with me here, church? But interestingly, in the midst of this plea, Jesus didn't say anything. Now that's rare for Jesus. But he's setting things up, isn't he? He's letting things play out. So his disciples come to him and says, well, she keeps crying out after her. She keeps begging. And so Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And of course, he is the Messiah of Israel. But now he's going to make a point. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me. I mean, this woman could not be stopped. Now she's down on her knees. Lord, please help me. And then Jesus tests her. He says, it's not right to take the children's bread, referring to the Jews, and toss it to their dogs. Because that would be how a Jew would address a Gentile. They're a dog. Right, Ken? Amen. Ken's our resident Jew right here, turned Christian. And in the midst of these words, this woman... She says, well, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Now, it's kind of interesting. The word crumbs right here is used in a diminutive sense. He says, 
Even the dogs get the little tiny crumbs that fall off the master's table. And Jesus goes, woman, you have awesome faith. Your request is granted. Boom. And that demon was driven on out. Question comes, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want the favor of God? This woman was a beggar, and she was going to stop at nothing until Jesus granted her request. You know, I think about our dear brothers and sisters out there in Palm Springs, Lordy, Samir, and Brandon. Every Sunday, they drive 125 miles to church here. My question is, how bad do you want to be right with God? I think about the Kirshners, who in wrestling with really being a part of a sold-out fellowship, literally gave up the promise of millions of millions of dollars with General Mills, gave up his job and his promising future there, and moved to Los Angeles without a job. Now, that's quite a challenge for a white-collar guy. See, they want the safety net. Well, I only want to move when I get a job. Kershaw says, listen, we're trusting in the Lord. We want to be in a fellowship where everybody's sold out. They came, and now, of course, he loves Guitar Hero because that's the company he works for. Amen, guys? How bad do you want it? Is it worth millions of millions of dollars to have the favor and the peace of God? You know, the other person that affected me at the house church leader's sharing time last night was Lou Jack. Lou Jack shared, he says, I, this has been one of the hardest and most glorious years of my life. He says, you know, I got baptized in 1986 when I was a student at Harvard University. Three years later, the Boston Church sent out the mission team to Los Angeles. He said, I was so fired up. He says, but from day one out of the waters of baptism, I just had one request of God. Just one request that my entire physical family would become baptized disciples of Jesus Christ. He said, I didn't have anything else on my heart. That was my passion. And sure enough, shortly after he came, his two sisters, his brother, And his mom got baptized. But his dad didn't. Year after year, through hard times and good times, Lou Jack persevered. Finally, 20 years later in 2006, Big Lou was baptized in the Lord. Why did Lou Jack share that this year was so glorious? Because his dad died earlier this year. But he died as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, even as disciples, we get so faked out by the things of this world. There's only one thing that really matters is whether or not a man or a woman is right with God when they die. There is heaven, but there is hell, and there is no purgatory. And the only ones that have the favor of God are those that are baptized disciples. Of Jesus Christ. You know, with Luis, he found the favor of God, even in his dad dying. You know, it's, we're at that stage in life right now where we hear about a dad, mom, grandpa, grandma passing away, and it brings such turmoil into our hearts. And it's because we know we've lost them in this life. But the beautiful thing that Lujak could share. He says, I have total peace that my dad is with God and that someday we will be reunited. My question is, how bad do you want it? Many of you have been coming to church for several weeks and you still haven't started studying the Bible yet you got to beg the person who brought you, please, I want to study the Bible. I want to be right with God. Some of you have been studying the Bible for several weeks and months and still haven't been baptized or restored yet. It's time to be like this woman right here. Get down on your knees and beg. Say, I want to be right with God before the year ends. How bad do you want it? 
Many of us are here and we, we have that same passion that Lou Jack has. We want our whole physical family to be baptized, to be saved, and to be with us up in heaven. Amen, church? But we've seen the flag in our faith after one year or two years or three years. Not understanding that it's all about God's timing right here. Twenty years Luchak waited for that day. And then the Lord took him just two years later. How about it? How bad do you want it? This Christmas, some of you are going home. Others are having your family come on in. I mean, do you have your mind set that you're going to have at least one good talk with everybody in your family? Or is it going to be kind of that light, superficial Christmas thing? My question is again. Do you want the favor of God? You know if you don't have that one talk, you're going to be restless and sleepless even as a disciple because you know that's what you need to do. See, God favors the beggar. Amen, church? Our last one is in Mark chapter 8. In verse 22. The disciples and Jesus came to Bethsaida. And some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes. Yes, that's what it says. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him. She says, do you see anything? <laughs> he goes, oh, I see people, and they look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. God favors the blind. You know, right here, Jesus and the disciples come to Bethsaida. And evidently, this, this blind man was somewhat popular amongst the people. He must have been a special person because many people brought him to Jesus. And the people begged Jesus to touch him. Now, of course, the whole issue right here is if Jesus touched him, he would have become unclean. But the fact that he would then heal him and make him be able to see again mean that Jesus would become not unclean, but clean again. So that... That's the cool thing about being the son of God. You know, amen. (laughs) But it's kind of interesting. Jesus literally grabs the blind man's hand and he walks him out of the city. Well, why do you think he did that? He wanted everybody to see that he was touching a blind man. He was parading him in front of everybody. Once he gets out of the city, he says, stand there a second. (laughs) (laughs) Then he takes his hand. He says, you see anything right there? He says, no, it's a little blurry a little bit. He says, people, they, 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 they seem like trees walking. Most likely this guy at one time had been able to see. But he'd lost his sight. And Jesus says, okay, just a moment. He touches him a second time, and the Bible says his eyes were opened, his sight restored, and he saw everything clearly. What a powerful thing is the second touch of Jesus. You know, tonight down in San Diego, a dear sister to many in the congregation, Christina Craig, is going to be restored. There was a day many years ago that she was baptized, she became a disciple, she was saved, and she was fired up for the Lord. But sadly, over time, she lost her faith, and she fell away. The great thing about God is if you're willing to come back, Jesus can give you a second touch of grace and be restored. Amen. Merry Christmas. Is your hair real? It is. It's sweet. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you, son. Amen. I appreciate that. Yes. Amen. I love you. Love you, man. Amen. Thanks. Amen. Thanks, Evan. 
Amen. Now, let's get back to the text right here. Santa Claus is not in the Bible, okay? I hope I didn't shake anybody's faith right there. But tonight, Christina Craig is going to receive the second touch of Jesus. Are you with me right here? You know, I think about some of the, the key families in the congregation here. Think about the Bordieres, the Antelons, and the Williamsons. You know, the Bordieres, they sacrificed a lot to come down on the mission team. They had a hard time. Nick got a job on down here, and then he lost that job, and he didn't have a job for several months that put incredible financial pressure on the family. At that same time, Denise found out she had cancer. Praise God, looks like she's cured now, amen? And then there's always the challenges of little girls growing up into sinners, amen, guys? But you know, you look at Nick and Denise today, and you can see that there's been a second touch of grace in their lives. You look at the Williamsons, you look at the Antelons, they got pretty beaten up there in Portland before they came on down. They kind of came limping on down here to Los Angeles. And yet you look at these two families, and yet with all the hits they've endured, you see a joy and a radiance because they understand what a second touch of Jesus is all about. I think about Elena's in my life. We didn't just have a second touch. We've had third, fourth, and fifth. And that's what some of you guys need is third, fourth, and fifth. That is the grace of God. What stops us? As disciples from seeing clearly. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Here's a passage we love to study, even with young disciples with, in Hebrews 3, verse 12. It's ironic how it starts out. See to it, brothers. That none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We've come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the confidence that we had at first. Amen. You know, the Bible says right here, it's the responsibility of every brother and every sister to make sure that each of us are encouraged in our faith every day. Amen, guys? Because every day, we get attacked by Satan. And if we give in to that sin, we can be deceived about where we really stand in the Lord. You know, one of the great challenges, I think, for people getting that second touch of Jesus is really seeing things clearly. You know, one of the great challenges of aging is that you collect a little baggage on the way. And we're not talking about body baggage right here. We're talking about emotional and spiritual baggage. And when you do that, you then become less trusting, more susceptible to qualms and quiet reservations. You become critical and critical of even the very thing that you need, which is discipling. Without discipling, without daily encouragement from one another, we're not going to make it. You may say, oh, yeah, I will. No, that's the deceitful of sin taking over right there. Many of us know of people who were disciples that had great discipling, and now that they drifted away from discipling, their marriage is ruined. Many of them are in a divorce. I mean, their, their lives are a shamble because they failed to see this verse that we all need Daily encouragement from each other. Or if we don't have daily encouragement, then our hearts will get hardened. You know, as disciples of Jesus, it's so easy to think that we're doing great spiritually when we kind of go solo. And we don't see our need to really be in great relationships with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Some people are afraid, say, well, I don't want to become dependent. Let me tell you something. You need to be dependent on the Lord, and you need to be dependent on your spiritual family, the church. The people that are, quote, guarded with brothers and sisters are the very ones 
that are hardened and deceived about where they really stand in the Lord. I'm not afraid to say. I'm dependent upon God, and I'm dependent upon my wife to do good spiritually. Now, ultimately, it's my responsibility. But I'm not afraid to surrender my heart to God, and I'm not afraid to surrender my heart to my wife. I mean, that is the power of relationships where trust and love is at the foremost. Amen, guys? Amen. You know, as disciples, we've got to really ask ourselves, have we begun to be twisted in our view of our spiritual lives? Are we not seeing clearly because we're deceived by sins? We don't have daily encouragement. Have we become critical of the leadership? Not to say that the leadership's perfect because we're all sinners. Amen, guys? I mean, remember, it's the sinners that found favor with God. Amen. <laughs> Are we people that are just waiting for the church to become perfect and then we're really going to give our hearts? Or are we the kind of side that says, listen, man, this church needs a lot of help. It's time for me to roll up my sleeves and get busy working for the Lord and helping to find solutions for the church. Are you with me right here? You know, this is a great time of reflection. We do have a little bit more time, most of us, this coming week. And instead of vegging out and watching every movie on TV there is, or watching all the bowl games, or whatever your predisposition of the flesh is, maybe to make sure, if anything, that this really is a Christmas time where you look at your heart, that you're about having contact with disciples. And not, so to speak, taking a Christmas vacation from being a disciple. Yeah, there's a change of pace right here. And Jesus had that change of peace as he went into Sidon, Tyre and Sidon right there. On the other hand, he never stopped being with the disciples. And as disciples of Christ, if we're going to another place, hey, we need to make sure we're in contact and staying encouraged. If we're here, yeah, it's time to draw in our physical families, but we need to make sure that some of the weaker brothers and sisters are being drawn into our families and have places to go during this time. This is some of the most lonely time for people, yes, even disciples, if they're not pulled into the true spiritual family. Are you with me here, church? On the other hand, it's a great time to get out your Bible, get some extra time to think about what God has done in your life in 2008. Do you have the heart of an Ashley says, I am just so thankful. I'm saved. I, I don't even recognize who I am. By all rights, I shouldn't even be. Is that your heart? I don't care how long you've been a disciple. That's where your heart needs to be. If it's not, then to find the favor of God, you need the second touch of Jesus. Let's close on out with Luke 10. Luke 10 is a passage that takes place right after the 72 have been sent out preaching the word. And we read in verse 23 these words. Then Jesus turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings, the ones that see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Wow. Do you imagine being there on that occasion with Jesus when he kind of pulls the inner circle together, the brothers and sisters, and he says, man, you see what is happening right now. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, and blessed are the ears that hear what you hear. There are prophets and kings have longed to see what you're seeing and hear what you're hearing. You know, I look back here at the City of Angels Church, in our first full calendar year, 2008. I mean, we just planted a year and a half ago. And in this year, not only has the Lord blessed us with over 100 people being baptized, 29 people being restored, but, I mean, we've had three church plantings out from this place. Is that incredible? I mean, the awesome disciples that have left here, they're now preaching the word in Honolulu, in Portland, and in New York. That's incredible, guys. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see and hear what you hear. I mean, it's exciting to hear about what the Lord is doing down in Santiago. Yes, we're sacrificing a lot for the Sullivans down there, but it's more than worth it when you hear about all the baptisms. Amen, guys? In just our first full calendar year, if you were to add up all those churches, we would have an attendance of 700.
hundred every morning. That's the multiplying effect. Bottom line, almost 150 baptisms this year. You won't find that any place else. That's not a boast. That's a fact. You know, even in the sold-out movement, I mean, we had the Jubilee. Was that incredible? We formed the central government of the movement. Wow. Just the past couple weeks, we completed forming the benevolent arm of the church, Mercy Worldwide. I mean, that's exciting. Amen, church? I mean, it's incredible that already in just two short years of this movement, there are now 34 churches in 17 nations. God is moving. Here's the thing. I believe with all of my heart, 2008 is only the beginning of the incredible things that God is going to do in 2009. But in order to take part in that, you got to be ready. You got to seek out the favor of God. Thank you, and God bless.